I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. This is a reading of Chapter 5 from the book Abominable Snowmen by Ivan T. Sanderson, published in 1961. The reading of Chapter 5 will be broken into two parts. The title of the chapter is Footprints on the Sands of. This is part one. Some things people accept. Some they reject. Others they will accept, as long as they have a ready-made answer. But certain things they simply don't know what to do about. If you look out of your window one morning to find that it is snowed during the night, you may be happy or you may be sad. If then, while contemplating this quite natural phenomenon, you perceive upon the pristine surface a number of marks of regular shape, forming a set of tracks. The sundry relays, feedbacks, and synapses in your brain may snap open or shut in ordered patterns, causing you to register, almost subconsciously, such concrete items as man, dog, car, snowplow, or such like. You may even go so far as to actually think, saying to yourself, That's funny. Mary went outside already. Foot tracks are commonplace, and quite logical, and we consider them as objects. Yet, they are not even quasi-objects. They are entirely negative physically, are purely subjective concepts, and in almost all cases are ephemeral things. Nevertheless, they are quite acceptable, provided we have a ready-made answer for them, ranging from vague terms such as dog, all the way to Mary wearing a particular pair of shoes. When, however, a set of foot tracks turns up on snow, or any other surface for that matter, to which people cannot immediately put a label, they become quite hysterical, and in their frantic efforts to explain this appalling thing, they will indulge in the most terrifying illogical actions. They also say the silliest things. Simple logic demands that a foot or any other print must have been made by something, and something which must have been at the point where the imprint was made. But sometimes, unfortunately for humanity, matters don't always work out that way, in either one or both of these respects. The second class of problems is the less awful. For instance, how on earth did Mary get up on the barn roof? May jolt you, but can have all sorts of logical explanations. If one is sufficiently concerned about Mary's welfare, it is the common practice to investigate these in order of likelihood, starting by asking Mary if she is around, and ending by calling in the long-suffering police if she has disappeared. Even in this class, however, there can be nasty ones. We once found a set of what looked like our tame porcupine's tracks inside an empty cage, which was constructed of heavy wire in the form of a cube on all six sides, and had a firmly locked door. That took some investigation and it reduced a number of normally sane citizens to gibbering idiots in the meantime. Said porcupine had once been housed in that cage for an hour or so, while its own cage was cleaned and repaired, by an assistant who was not present when the bizarre discovery was made. The earth floor inside the cage had been wet at the time, and the animal had left deep tracks in the clay-like mud. This dried solid. The assistant had then in accord with his routine duties, put a two-inch covering of fresh earth over this. The night before the uproar, there had been about 15 minutes of torrential rain, which had washed all of the top layer exactly off of the old hardened one, and the tracks had appeared looking just as if they were fresh, and, of course, once again in damp earth. The more abominable class is that of individual prints or sets of tracks. And the two items are quite different and should be at all times most carefully defined by the use of the appropriate term, for which there is not a ready-made explanation. A print, or imprint, is an individual item such as that of one foot. A set of tracks, or a track, is, on the other hand, a series of prints, either interrupted, as in animals, 
or continuous, as made by wheeled machines, left by some moving object. There are quite a lot of reports of single prints being found both in such positions, as may be explained, as in a small patch of mud on a rocky path, but on occasion, in places that cannot be explained. These last are, of course, very unnerving. Sasquatch imprints and tracks, along with those of their relatives or cogeners, by whatever name they were known, were perfectly all right by the Amerins because they had just such a ready-made answer, all of them, as they readily tell me, knowing perfectly well that they were made by the big, wild, hairy men of the woods, or by their wives and children. As the Amerins gave up being Americans and started to become, or were forced to become, sort of bogus Europeans, they forgot to tell their own children about these personages. The result was that, in time, we have Amerins becoming, for a time, slightly disturbed. Amerins never, under any conditions, became hysterical. When, however, white men first saw these large ABSM tracks, they invariably went into a fairly advanced trauma. This habit was apparently universal among Europeans and people of European origin, right up until the time when a ready-made answer became disseminated, namely, Sasquatches, Omas, etc. Whereupon, a happy reaction set in. This was simply to say, oh those, don't worry, they're made by runaway Indians. They have huge feet, you know, and sometimes grow hair to keep out the cold. Amarins, I should point out here, are either wholly or substantially of mongoloid ancestry, the group of the human race that is defined as being the most glabrous, almost without body hair, and having particularly small, neat feet. It is rather interesting to note in passing that persons of African ancestry have behaved quite otherwise throughout. They possess ancestors who have always recognized a non-material world just as widespread and as real as the material one. This is probably why they are such great pragmatists. What is more, according to them, entities in both worlds customarily muck about in the other, so that men's souls can range around elsewhere, and chumbus, or what we in our innocence call ghosts, poltergeists, and spirits, can, in their estimation, quite well leave imprints and foot tracks. Africans of the Negroid branch of humanity and their descendants are, therefore, the greatest skeptics throughout our story. They have never really been interested in or even much surprised about the matter, for they have a sort of built-in answer. And while they have always thought Europeans to be stupid for not carrying on with disembodied entities, they usually think the Amerins quite batty for needing an embodied entity to explain these tracks. The few people of African origin whom I have met in the course of this business in North America, as well as in Africa, appear furthermore to have accepted the physical appearance of ABSMs that they themselves have witnessed with the utmost equanimity and simply as lucky or dangerous happenstances. I bring all this up now because it has to be aired in any case sooner or later, and because from now on we are going to have all three major branches of the human race involved in the matter. The reactions are indeed different, whatever anybody may say about generalizations. All three races are present in the United States, where our story now takes us, and since we are going to follow the foot tracks of the ABSMs clear through this country to tropical America, we're going to have to be prepared for some real surprises both ways. You will see what I mean by this in a minute. At this point, I would ask you to glance at maps 3 and 16 in the book before proceeding, because without some idea of the facts of vegetational distribution, very little of what I have to say in this and the next chapter will make much sense. I know by experience that it is quite all right for me or anybody else to say almost anything about foreign lands. And the further away, and thus foreign they are, the more outrageous the claims may be. This is the reason why such a high percentage of, quote, explorers are found, on proper investigation, if that is possible, which it seldom is, to be phonies, even if only mildly and innocuously so. When, on the other hand, anybody makes even slightly unusual remarks about the country in which he is speaking, and to citizens of that country, he is almost certain to be disbelieved, probably ridiculed, and oft times harassed for his pains. This applies to statements as innocent as, you know, the hillbillies down there don't wear shoes. 
try it sometime down there, but don't wait to see what happens, for you'll have the local state department on your back if you have published your statement, and you'll find yourself excluded from private swimming pools if you have merely said it in family circles. Since I have a private swimming duck pond of my own, and seldom wear shoes indoors in winter, or either in or out of doors throughout the whole summer and early fall, as well as for other reasons that I will not go into, I have made a profession of saying things about the country I am in. I am, in fact, and as I said at the outset, a reporter. And as I don't give a damn whether anybody wears shoes or not, nor what their opinions are on that or any other subject, and am interested only in facts, I am constantly saying things that annoy people. What I have to say now is going to annoy some types very much. Moreover, if you haven't as yet glanced at these maps, you may be so annoyed that you will just stop reading. I don't want you to do this, but for purely altruistic reasons, namely that these facts are such fun. To keep you reading, therefore, let me just tell you that if you do so, you are going to get a really good laugh, specifically at the expense of just those people whom you have always thought were idiots in any case. Admittedly, this includes almost everybody other than yourself, which makes it all the more pleasant. Animals and ABSMs take no account of political boundaries, even when they are physically erected by people in the form of barbed wire fences or iron curtains. They do, on the other hand, not only take into account, but conform absolutely to certain boundaries and dividing lines set up by nature. No animal ever, it seems, transgresses such a boundary, and these boundaries may often be so precise that you can stand with one foot in one great natural province and the other foot in another. There are animals that range over more than one and sometimes over half a dozen provinces. These are called Catholic species, but most animals stay within the confines of just one province. Within the provinces, moreover, there are a number of natural niches or environments. Nature abhors a vacuum, as we have been repeatedly told, and she fills all her niches with an appropriate animal species. If anyone dies out or is exterminated, some other animal will come in to inhabit its niche. As an example, the South American aquatic porcupine called the koipu, myopotamus koipu, the fur of which is called nutria, was introduced into North America 50 years ago and immediately started to fill up the niche previously occupied by the beaver, which had, at that time, been largely exterminated in this country by fur trappers. Sometimes, a species of animals will introduce itself into an area and do battle with the established occupants of the particular niche that it likes. Then again, men have introduced animals from one country to another and started virtual animal wars, usually with fatal consequences to one or the other party. In Australia, introduced European animals like the dog, cat, fox, and rabbit have committed mass mayhem on the indigenous fauna. On the other hand, attempts to introduce the pheasant in certain parts of North America have repeatedly failed. The whys and the wherefores of these results have proved very puzzling in that there seemed to be no rhyme or reason for them. There is nonetheless a law governing the matter, and a very precise one. This is a botanical matter. The whole earth is portioned out into different types of plant growth, different in the way the vegetation grows in height, density, and so forth, rather than in what particular types of plants it contains. And these form great belts around the earth, regardless of oceans, seas, and mountains. These belts, which meander about and broaden out or wither down sometimes almost to nothing, are also subdivided into blocks or provinces going from east to west, like the cross stripes on a banded snake. Each one of these provinces has its own history, climate, weather, soils, flora, and fauna. What is more, it has now been discovered that all faunas are wholly dependent upon vegetation, but not so much upon the constitution of that vegetation as upon the way in which it grows. Human beings are animals, and they conform to these general principles too, even down to the national types. So, it seems, do ABSMs. For further details of all of this, 
See chapter 18. Man, however, is what is called an adaptable animal. He is also incredibly tough and can survive in more types of vegetation and in a wider variety of environments than most animals, being surpassed in this ability by only a few other animals, such as the spiders and their allies, which live in water and in air and range from ice caps to still hot lava flows and to the tops of mountains where even plants give up. Nevertheless, when man comes to settle down and try to earn a living and breed, even he conforms to the old patterns. Hollanders gyrate to coastal flats and Norwegians to warm, wet fjords. However, man can survive an ousting from his natural environment, and he has often done so. The Neanderthalers appear to have been driven back into the hills by the folk of Cro-Magnon culture, and the Jews were blasted all over the lot and have survived. ABSMs, it seems, have also been driven back into certain environments. By the time my story is told, you will see why I say this and why it happened. There is nothing mysterious about it. It is simply that ABSMs are hominids, or, just as every benighted native has always asserted, human rather than animal, and thus are endowed in one degree or another with human attributes, most notably their powers of survival, their adaptability, their toughness, and their acuteness. The pongids, or apes, on the other hand, though looking so like humans, are the lousiest adapters, are completely stuck with their special environments and in their particular provinces. They can hardly breed outside them, even with the very best and most modern human medical assistance, as witness the tiny number of gorillas born in captivity. In other words, about 50 million years ago, nature started an experiment with a couple of primate types now called the hominid and the pongid. The first made the great, and mostly through the efforts and discoveries of ABSMs, the latter failed and are doomed. If there are ABSMs in North America, as well as Central and South America, as would appear from what follows, and they are hominids, they must have come here from somewhere else. For we can say with almost absolute certainty that neither man nor the hominids has evolved in the New World. What is more, not so much as a single bone or other indication has ever been discovered suggesting that either the pongids or any of the true monkeys ever even got here. On the other hand, men got here, and at a rather early date. Bones of the animals he brought back from hunting forays have been dated certainly back to before the last ice advance. Some are claimed to be more than 40,000 years old. We have not yet obtained the bones of the earliest of these men themselves, but if some anthropologists are right, there are some extremely old and quite primitive stone implements at the lowest levels, and we now know that a creature, such as East Africa's Zenjanthropus, was a toolmaker, but most certainly would be called an ABSM if he were found running around today. Failure to find the bones of ABSMs is no cause for stating that they never existed. Tools of the types known as Chilean and Anchulian have been known from all over southern Europe and Africa since men started collecting such items but it was not until the last decade that we found a single bone of the men who made them, if we have yet done so, as a matter of fact. However, ABSMs seem once to have roamed much of North America. Why then should those alleged still to do so, although really very hominid in form, appear to be without tools, fire, or speech? We have to look at it this way. They were probably here in the purely animal stage of their development, yet they kept coming in waves, over the Bering Straits, if you like, at ever-increasingly efficient levels of tool-making and development, until they were replaced by their cousins who were so something or other that we, upon digging up their remains, call them men. Lots of these came, too, making ever better tools until the misguided Amerins made the mistake of tagging along. At this point, we enter history and the domain of other specialties. As brighter and better ABSMs turned up, however, the previous occupants had to move out into less desirable environments, nasty places like deserts and mountains, 
and by the time proper men arrived, these places were getting quite crowded. At that point, another factor became operative. ABSMs, both here and all over the world, had been getting, quote, better, which is another way of saying more complicated or mixed up, and thus, in certain ways, less efficient again. The more complex their culture became, and don't think that they didn't have a culture, for Nutcracker Man, Zinjathropus, of 600,000 years ago in East Africa, made splendid tools, but had a brain somewhat more paltry than the average chimp. The more dependent they were upon an easy environment, which means one where it was easy to obtain a living, chased out into the rough one by still more cultured chaps, they began to find the going very hard. In fact, the more, quote, cultured they were, the worse they fared when pushed up into the mountains, and the more advanced they were, the more easily and rapidly they gave up and became extinct. Thus, we have the extraordinary spectacle of the more primitive surviving and the more advanced wilting away. Today, only the most primitive have apparently survived, and in the remotest and ruggedest places where any other ABSM less rugged could not get along, where man, however tough, failed, and where even modern man, who has really got somewhere with his culture, finds it hard going. And just where is this? The answer is very simple and absolutely definitive. It is what is called by botanists the Montane Forests. This is why I suggested that you take a look at the maps and see where such forests are, especially today, on our continent. From these, you will note that their distribution coincides exactly with that of the reports of our ABSMs, as it does on all the other continents with their ABSMs. There is only one exception from the botanical point of view, and this I would like to dispose of forthwith. The last retreat on land of anything is a forest. In North America, between those latitudes occupied by the United States, most lowland forests are woodlands, and anything unwanted in them has long ago been eliminated. One can't speak of feral dogs because we introduce them. In Canada, of course, such forests are still virtually impenetrable. There remain then the montane forests, which are not quite the same thing as mere forests on mountains, and one other type of vegetational growth. This is what are called technically the bottomlands. By this is meant swamps at low level, but mostly in river valleys and deltas, that are covered with a closed canopy forest of some kind, however short in stature and which are either flooded all the time, seasonally, or from time to time, so that they are unpleasant for man to live in, and a lost cause to try and clear, drain, and farm. It so happens that we have a very great acreage of just such country in the United States that is tacitly ignored by everybody, and frankly unknown to most. This is concentrated along the Mississippi Valley, and up the valleys of the tributaries of that great river. The best road maps of the states that straddle these bottom lands look perfectly okay at first sight, being covered with roads of various grades, having names of counties, townships, and so forth scattered all over them, and seeming, when viewed individually, to be quite consistent with all other road maps of our country. If, however, you look more carefully at them, take a pair of dividers, consult the scale at the foot of the map, and then select your areas carefully, you can isolate almost endless parts of the map that look like this. The enclosed illustration shows a section of northern Louisiana of approximately 1,050 square miles, with no inhabitation. This you will not, of course, believe. It will also probably make you very annoyed. You might therefore assuage your fury by going out and buying or writing to one of the oil companies to obtain maps of such states as Missouri, Illinois, Kentucky, Tennessee, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, and spend a moment or two with a rectangle of the dimensions and the scale of the above. It will probably make you even more angry, but I said that I would name names, even if I am, quote, down there, end quote. The reason I bring this obnoxious subject up at this time is that before we can get back to the main road of our travelogue, there is something that is really unpleasant that has to be taken care of. 
This is the, quote, little red men of the trees, end quote. How aggravating can I get? And how far out on what limb can I wriggle? You would be surprised indeed, but I warn you in the most friendly fashion, please don't forget that I am a reporter and, as of now, nothing else. It is therefore my duty to report to you. So, here goes. Dear Sir, my name is James Meacham. I read the article that you wrote for True Magazine. I have been planning on going to California in the same area that your article was about. I was a little surprised to read about such a creature as an abominable snowman living so close to where I intended to visit. I have always liked to explore places that other people care little about. I would like to know all you can tell me about this creature, if you can tell me anything more than you did in the article. I'm sure a man of your standing must have more information about this subject than was in those few pages. I will gladly pay the postage on the information you can send. I cannot offer more because I am not working at the present. I have met a few strange things in my life. As I am still young, there are many more I will probably see. I would like to know if you can tell me anything about a creature that looks like a small ape or a large monkey that has hair the color of fur, a red orangish color. I saw such a creature when I was 15. A friend was with me, but did not see it. Whatever it was did not have a tail like a monkey, but it did swing like one by its arms. This may sound like something that I thought I saw, but really didn't, which I would believe except for a few details. I had a twenty two caliber semi-automatic with me. I watched this thing for about five minutes, so I have to believe it. I put fourteen twenty two long rifle shells into whatever it was. From where I was standing, I couldn't have missed. We found one bullet in the tree trunk, so 13 of them hit it. The part that sounds more impossible is that whatever it was did not even move while 13 bullets went into it. If I had missed, all 14 bullets would have gone into the tree trunk. I've told many people about this, but nobody believes it. We found a few hairs where I had shot, but nothing else except the bullet. There was not a trace of blood. My partner thinks it was a squirrel, but no squirrel grows that big. If it had been one, two of those bullets would have stopped it dead. Whatever it was did not even move till I headed for the tree. It traveled through those trees like an express train. I could hear the leaves rattle, but could not see it. I searched for a long time after that, but never saw it again. No one in that area knows anything about it, or has ever seen it. It had a cry that was enough to drive a person crazy. This was almost three years ago, 1957, and I still wake up in my sleep sometimes when that sound comes back to me. If you can give me any advice as to what it could have been, I will greatly appreciate it. If I had not shot it myself, I would not believe it, not being able to find any blood. I know you must receive a lot of letters about this sort of thing. But all I want to know is, what animal in a marsh near Jackson, Tennessee, could hold 13 long rifle shells without even moving till you start to come after it? This is what started me looking for things most people think cannot possibly exist. Yours truly, James M. Meacham. In 1954, a young orangutan escaped from a shipment of apes to a well-known Florida organization, took off into the woods, and has never been seen again. I refrain from giving further details because the valuable ape was paid for, but reported as DOA, a trade term for dead on arrival, and someone still might get in trouble. The incident is fairly widely known in certain circles and has been a perfect nuisance because when anything like the above is reported, even as far away as Tennessee, it is immediately dredged up by way of explanation. I suppose it is just possible that a healthy young Mia, a better name for what we call the orangutan, could survive a succession of mild southern winters, and it could travel an enormous distance by trees alone. But what would it eat during most of the year? I don't know. Much more important is that a lost ape that has once been in captivity for even a short period would be almost certain to head for the nearest human habitation the moment it got hungry or saw anything novel that frightened it. In all the years that I had a zoo, 
I never knew an escaped animal, apart from local fauna and even many of those, not to return voluntarily to its own cage during the night. Of course, this ape might have escaped from some zoo much nearer the place where this correspondent said he saw it, but the loss of a $5,000 specimen from a zoo would not go unnoticed, though it must be admitted it might well go unreported, to the directors, that is. There is as much hanky-panky in the animal business as in any other. An escaped Mia is, however, I rather think, itself merely an escape mechanism, as it is called, especially when we come to contemplate the following. From Hoosier Folklore, Volume 5, page 19, March 1946. Another type of story that is much more concerned to us here in southern Illinois nowadays is the, quote, strange beast legend. Every few years, some community reports the presence of a mysterious beast over in the local creek bottom. Although it is difficult to determine just where a story of this sort has its beginning, this one seems to have originated in the Gum Creek bottom near Mount Vernon. During the summer of 1941, a preacher was out hunting squirrels in the woods along the creek when a large animal that looked something like a baboon jumped out of a tree near him. The preacher struck at the beast with his gun barrel when it walked toward him in an upright position. He finally frightened it away by firing a couple of shots into the air. Later, the beast began to alarm rural people by uttering terrorizing screams, mostly at night in the wooded bottomlands along the creeks. School children in the rural districts sometimes heard it, too, and hunters saw its tracks. By early spring of 1942, the animal had local people aroused to a fighting pitch. About that time, a farmer near Bonnie reported that the beast had killed his dog. A call went out for volunteers to join a mass hunt to round up the animal. The beast must have got some news of the big hunt, for reports started coming in of its appearance in other creek bottoms, some as much as 40 or 50 miles from the original site. A man driving near the Big Muddy River in Jackson County one night saw the beast bound across the road. Some hunters saw evidence of its presence away over in Oka. Its rapid changing from place to place must have been aided considerably by its ability to jump, for by this time reports had it jumping along at from 20 to 40 feet per leap. It is impossible to say how many hunters and parties of hunters armed with everything from shotguns to ropes and nets went out to look for the strange beast in the various creek bottoms where it had been seen, or its tracks had been seen, or its piercing screams had been heard. Those taking nets and ropes were intent on bringing the creature back alive. Usually, this strange beast can't be found, and interest in it dies as mysteriously as it arose in the beginning. About 25 years ago, a coon hunter from Hecker one night heard a strange beast coming up ahead in Prairie du Long Creek, Hunters chased this phantom from time to time all one winter. Their dogs would get the trail, then lose it. And they would hear it screaming down the creek in the opposite direction. It was that kind of creature. You'd hear it up creek, but when you set out in that direction, you'd hear it a mile down creek. And again, Dear Mr. Sanderson, I listened to you on Long John Neville's program last Thursday and was very much surprised that you talked about such things as abominable snowmen in America. I am a housewife, but I majored in biology, attended our state university, and have an M.A. in plain zoology. My husband is an experimental chemist employed by, company name withheld for obvious reasons noted by the author, and my eldest son is a technician in the Air Force. I come from Mississippi, but we have resided here in Kentucky for 10 years now. I wonder if you have ever heard of the little red men of the Delta. Nobody thought anything much of them where I was raised, except that one had better be careful of shooting one because it might be murder, or so the sheriff might think if anything came of it. But I was surprised to find that the folks hereabout know it too, though they took some years to talk about it to me. My husband is a New Englander, and these folks don't talk much. They are, the little red men of the Delta, said to be about the size of a ten-year-old kid, and able to climb like monkeys, and to live back from the bayous. They talk a lot, but keep out of gunshot range, and mostly go into the water. 
They are people, and the muskrat trappers say they often wear scraps of discarded lines, linens, old jeans, and such. If you have heard about them, will you please talk about them on the air, as it puzzles me that nobody has ever talked about them, but everybody in some places seems to know about them. There was sure nothing in my biology course about them, but there's a lot of folks don't know or don't talk about. Yours, etc., Mrs. V. K. And you can say that again. Plain ordinary citizens just don't talk. They are born with too much sense. Ridicule is the most dastardly thing and can ruin one's whole life in one small jump. It takes real guts to come right out and say you've seen the Loch Ness Monster and you better have private means if you do. Otherwise, humanity at large will round on one and jump in unison and they have a collective memory that can last for a century. Don't do it, brethren and sistren. That's why I always ask specifically whether I may publish a name. This concludes Part 1 of Chapter 5 in the book Abominable Snowmen. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.